Hi, everyone. I've met many of you, and um, we're going to jump into a little deeper today talking about the critical infrastructure assessment work group and the, the efforts that are underway. So this, I talked to this group maybe three years ago. Um, it was in person, so it was a while ago. And these are just some updates. Um, and Steve and I talked and we would really like it if we had some conversation about this material. So I'm going to talk about um, what we mean by critical infrastructure, because there's many different definitions. Um, I'll just give a little background about how I'm using it and um, how I'm connected to this work. And then the Critical Infrastructure Assessment Work Group, which is a part of this Emergency Preparedness um, Committee of the Geospatial Advisory Council, um, and then what that work group is doing. So efforts to improve the data, some of the state resources that we have been uh, working with MinGeo on, um, what else we're doing, and then what is next. But I think jump in anytime you can chat or just um, raise your hand or something if you want to make a comment, that would be great. So critical infrastructure, uh, what do we mean? Well, um, critical infrastructure to me um, is defined by these 16 sectors uh, that the Department of Homeland Security National Infrastructure Protection Plan had put in place. Um, since this time, there has been a little bit of a simplification in tw a 2020 response framework. They are now talking more about um, community lifelines and these seven categories of community lifelines. Um, but however you suggest that uh, we're talking about critical infrastructure, um, for the purpose of a geospatial work group, um, one, we're talking about things that can be mapped and we still want to consider that uh, we're looking at facilities and infrastructure that provide the most fundamental services in the community. So if any of these, these facilities or infrastructure are damaged or disabled, then, um, then society is unable to function um, as it needs to uh, post disaster. Um, so in a geospatial context, um, we are interested in mapping and to narrow it down a little bit more, uh, most of what I have been mapping has been points and lines and not so much the, the capabilities, but really uh, the where. So where do these, um, these locations exist? Where do these facilities and in the case of transportation um, structures, infrastructure um, systems exist? So I work, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, with the University of Minnesota and Duluth, um, we have been under contract to work with the Homeland Security and Emergency Management Office for several years, actually a decade, um, doing hazard mitigation planning. And we are working on currently a state hazard mitigation plan. And so I just threw up, um, for that, for some context, um, in a state hazard mitigation plan, uh, we need to identify state assets, um, including state-owned or operated buildings, infrastructure, community lifelines, and critical facilities. So all of this together is kind of how I think of critical infrastructure. And I realize some of you may have more um, defined uh uh, def just definitions that are more specific, um, but we're looking for anything that we can map um, to benefit this kind of plan. So we don't need to know necessarily the, the capabilities or anything that is um, under lock and key that would be a security risk. 
Um, we're just looking for things that can be used in planning um, for uh, for public consumption in a in a plan environment. So in a PDF or on a website to identify where they are um, and some level of of um, condition or access to these these facilities. So that's that's kind of the background that I'm coming from. Um, I have one more slide on that, which is that um, this requirement is in the terms of planning, really where populations, infrastructure, and critical facilities are vulnerable to hazards and to what degree injuries or damage may occur. So my work is working on the risk to community assets where it can be mapped. Um, and so with this critical infrastructure work group, uh, I think I'm interested in representing um, planners and other geospatial professionals that could use these asset data for planning purposes and to some level response. But I certainly acknowledge that there is a there is more that might be needed for a response kind of infrastructure um, in in databases. And we are really more on the the pre-disaster and planning side when we're talking about um, what can be public. And again, I just I just want to set that out there so that um, I'm not suggesting that anything that is a security risk or needs to be um, you know not public be made available. That's that's not the point. Um, we through this planning, we have been working with counties across Minnesota. We worked with almost all of the counties to develop hazard mitigation plans. And we have found that a lot of the state data that we were getting from, um, well, from MinGeo or, or its predecessor um, had some inaccuracy. So things change, fire stations move locations or are closed. Um, New schools are built, schools are closed, schools merge, things happen, right? And so um, what we were finding is that there was, there was a snapshot of data that was really good done um, like in 2009, 2010, and then it got a little bit static. So um, the last few years, uh, we have been trying to work with communities to make sure that the communities working with can verify their locations. And um, I'm gonna just show now a couple of, of snapshots of how the hazard mitigation planning efforts end up. So our goal is to be able to create these platforms. They're actually ArcGIS hub sites for every community we work with that has a dashboard of critical infrastructure. Um, for their communities. And if I if I dare, I'm gonna go live here. Um, can you see the, the the browser now? Anyone? Yes, I sure can. Okay, great. Okay. I just want to make sure I shared it correctly. Okay, so this is uh, Douglas County Hazard Mitigation Plan. And in the county profile section, um, there is a section on demographics and economy. Um, and then this critical infrastructure dashboard um, has locations of, in this case, law enforcement, fire, emergency operations centers. So those things are uh, linked with this dashboard to identify the locations. And this same dashboard has a similar thing for all the hospitals um, and boarding care, dialysis centers, these um, healthcare services, and then also schools and shelters. So this again is just Douglas County. And if I go down um, a little bit further, there's also a dashboard for utility and transportation infrastructure. And so these are things like um, the, the major transmission lines, uh, major pipelines, railroads. Um, and again, these are all just the public access things. Um, 
wastewater facilities, substations, and bridges. So you can you can select them on and off and get a sense of those. Um, the the last thing, which isn't critical infrastructure in many senses of the word, but um, we also are in hazard mitigation planning, mapping county assets. So that would include correctional facilities, uh, mobile home parks and campgrounds and um, historic places. And the reason why mobile homes and campgrounds are in this profile is because uh, they are very vulnerable to high wind events and sometimes flooding events. Mobile home parks and campgrounds tend to be in areas that that um, that flood and their structures tend to be more vulnerable. So this is a, um, a not all critical infrastructure, but this is how we're trying to demonstrate what facilities are in a county for hazard mitigation planning. Um, that's one look at it. And then the next um, way we do this is we look at for flooding, we are mapping the flooding, which is beyond the, the scope of this talk at the moment, but I can certainly tell you more about that. Um, but we also do then look at any of those mapped infrastructure points and identify which ones have fallen within um, the modeled flood, um, flood 1% annual chance flood zone. So in this case, in Isanti County, there is a critical infrastructure um, school. There's a school in Isanti that is within that, that flood margin. Um, and so this is part of the planning. We just want the, the community to then uh, do some further work to make sure that that school is elevated or maybe it's been protected, um, but it's a, a way to alert um, officials that that's there. And also this is a requirement of FEMA. So that is, that's what they're looking for. They wanna know um, what's in the flood zone. Um, for the state hazard mitigation plan, we need to I do this exact same thing for all of the state owned and occupied buildings in the state. So interesting, interestingly enough, um, those are not all geolocated. We have to do a lot of manual work. The state, our um, state uh, office doesn't have state owned buildings. They have it, they have a facilities database, but there's addresses there and they don't all have just um, identified the structures. So there's a little, there's a little manual work there. So um, with that background, I think you can see why I was interested in looking at the critical infrastructure as a whole and all different kinds of data sets across the board, who knows about where these are, who are the stewards, um, and how can we get local data um, to inform the state databases better. Ultimately, how can we get them back into the national databases? Um, and Steve was, sh was showing before that there's kind of a convoluted way that things get up through contractors to the national databases um, and then back through our Homeland Security Emergency Management Office. Um, and how can we have a workflow so that we in Minnesota are using our best available data sets from local to national levels. Um, so that's when the Critical Infrastructure Assessment Work Group was born to, um, to look into these data sets. And this year in 2023, the Critical Infrastructure Data Workflow was voted um, or ranked using a, a, a metric that involved some um, participation of the geospatial community. It was ranked uh, of in the top ones of the project initiatives. So you can see there's a few of the top initiatives are there and critical infrastructure was something that was high priority. So um, something we're continuing to work on um, in this group and through the Geospatial Advisory Council priorities. 
Uh, this work group is comprised of a smallish group of folks right now, and we um, are actively recruiting, always looking for more uh, participants. And but I do think we have a, a decent spread of of state people, county people, um, some local people, and then also the state agencies, uh, Department of Commerce. Um, I think Barbara is on the phone call today and she works with the energy sector um, and also Mike Kudnick works with um, some nonprofit organizations and also a national organization. Um, we are interested in uh, private sector individuals as well, but this is our mix right now. And I would invite anyone who's interested um, to attend our next meeting on July 14th. Um, we do have a lot of discussion. Um, part of the part of the point is just to share out what each other is doing and and what the status of data sets are. And once in a while, we get a new member who's like, "Oh yeah, I work with this data set, and we never knew anything about it." So it's it's great to have new members and see how we can uh, wrangle these things into one place. So one thing that I'm proud of that we worked with Mingeo on was to just get uh, a list, just a list of critical infrastructure resources um, in Minnesota and what the, the group collectively who has worked with these data know to be the most complete and current data sets. So for example, um, the healthcare facilities, these are all, um, the data provider is the Minnesota Department of Health, and the Department of Health um, maintains an active, updated database. However, um, the comments are that they aren't um, geocoded regularly, so they are they're up to date, but they need to be ge geocoded and and um, mapped out into these different themes: hospitals, nursing, boarding homes, and and healthcare other databases. So they're all together in one big database. They are up to date, but they require a geospatial um, intervention to put them on a map. Um, the pharmacies are available from the Minnesota Board of Pharmacies, the Minnesota State Board of Pharmacists. Um, however, there, that is not uh, a database that you can easily get. You need to uh, work with somebody in research or um, have some kind of pharmacy project to actually get that data. But it is made available through Rx Open, which is a national uh, a national viewer that uh, maps, they, they obtain the data from the Minnesota Board of Pharmacists and then map those data and you can download them from their website. So I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, but these are just examples of how um, we have tried to identify where if you need the most current and up-to-date and comprehensive data set, where you would find that. And then um, if it's ready to go or if it needs some, um, some level of verification. Uh, so a couple of things that we've worked on in the work group besides this, this list is we have worked with um, the fire station data that was provided from the National Homeland, um, let's see, Highfield, the Homeland Infrastructure Foundational Level data sets. And those, uh, that database is something that um, is commonly pulled from for all kinds of emergency management and response activities. Um, but the, the contractor that maintains those data sets don't always have the most current information from the locals about, about um, where fire stations are. And so we have through my office um, and hazard mitigation planning, we've been able to verify locations and update them and then publish a data set through the Minnesota GeoCommons um, that has a, a more corrected version of fire stations. So that's another example of how, how we're working with these data. Um, 
There's others here, transportation, utility, dams and levees and cultural resources that come from some national sources as well. This list is something that if you have information about other data sets that should be on this list for public users in Minnesota, um, and, or if you know of another resource that uh, we are missing, please do let me know because this is this is meant to be a, a living um, resource that you can access and, and use for those data sets. All right. Um, so one thing we have done through the use spatial office for hazard mitigation planning and how we actually get the local information from when I say local, the, the counties that we're working with is we have, um, we, we created this interface, this web interface for critical infrastructure in Minnesota and just the essential facilities. So in, in this definition, emergency facilities, healthcare facilities and schools and shelters. For any of those three themes, um, someone from the county, we just give this particular application to uh, officials in the county. They can select their county they, or tribe. They can select a facility name that they're interested in verifying. And then they can move around this map to find and locate actual buildings on the imagery to make sure that they are correct. And there's an option then to um, edit or delete that, that um, facility location or also report new locations that they are not finding. There is a version of this um, on the, uh, in the Minnesota fire station. So if you, whoops, sorry, if you do go to the Minnesota Fire Stations data set that is on the Minnesota Geospatial Commons, um, and you, you use that, you view the metadata, you'll see in the metadata record, it says if you have um, the ability to report an inaccuracy in this data set, please go to the application here. And there's a link to the, uh, another interface that looks just like this, only it's not, um, it's the the one that we don't allow, or the one that we allow public access to, not the one that we allow the officials to. So the difference is that if you submit something through this metadata record, um, it will will receive a message in our office. We will send that information to the the county official, um, and depending on what what type of facility it is, to to verify that that's. Um, an accurate location. And that was our solution so that we could crowdsource this information, get the best available, but make sure that we weren't just um, inheriting junk from people who wanted to uh, just mess with us or who weren't, um, weren't officially able to report a um, discrepancy in our data set. All right, uh, the next thing is the the assessment work group, um, this is our hub site. So we do have, we're, we're working on it. It's actually not public. I'm hoping like in another well, maybe two months, we'll have this work group available so that you can go to this work group. Um, this is what's under construction. And I think Steve mentioned that we're meeting on July 11th to talk about this and get it ready for um, public consumption. But basically we want, people to know what we're doing in this work group. We want people to know how to connect and also to be able to easily access some of the products that we've been working on. So these are quick links to some of the data sets that we have verified and worked with. Um, there's uh, information here about what we're working on. And um, instead of reading all these words, actually, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And in our work plan, so what we're doing right now is we are working on uh, a written and documented long-term workflow to keep the these emergency facilities that we, we have this application for, to keep them updated annually from Minnesota counties. Um, we want that to be as sustainable as possible and not just um, disappear when 
um, when personnel changes or when um, if Mingeo changes their infrastructure with how they um, they deliver the products. We want to make sure that we have something that can be um, maintained. We also want to maintain that critical infrastructure resource list on the Mingeo website. So um, again, that that is always uh, being checked. We have initiated validation for um, about 20 more counties that we're working with and the remaining metro counties. Um, we have a few metro counties that we weren't able to verify the locations of some of those facilities with. We just wanna send it to somebody who has the authority to look at those and then, um, and then say in our data sets that they have been verified. And then uh, we have another data set that we're ready to, um, to validate and get published, the GeoCommons, which is a correctional facilities data set. There were just a few changes from the last one that was published, and we're just working on updating that new published version. Um, the committee, the work group committee, is also coordinating with some other Geospatial Advisory Council committees. One of them is a new committee to, um, to evaluate and work on national relationships with FEMA, with Highfield, with um, other entities that might have mapping, um, even, even Google Maps or Esri that are publishing base maps. And we want to figure out what the workflow is to make sure that the best available data um, that is publicly available can be also consumed by those resources. And so that that's become a whole nother committee. So it's not just up to our work group to figure that out. And Allison's been heading that. We've had a, a meeting or two about that. There's also a new outreach committee that is working with success stories um, for all kinds of different geospatial data. But I have been working with the the work group, the critical infrastructure work group, to uh, to develop um, a couple of stories of the work that we've done, and one of them is working with Barbara Conti at um, Department of Commerce and the NREL on-site energy systems uh, report. So this is how I first met Barbara. The they had a big project with NREL, and they were looking at prioritizing on-site energy system upgrades at critical facilities in Minnesota, and they needed to do some mapping, and um, they were asking where where to get the best available data. And so we were able to um, connect them with, with people for some of the less obvious um, structure data and contribute to that project. So um, that was a success, and I'd like to be able to share that so others can see how this data is used um, by others besides just um, in emergency planning. Um, and then there's uh, the hub site as well. Um, I think Steve also mentioned that uh, Mingeo has been working with HSEM in partnership to discuss um, roles and how we might be able to share some of the, the load of verifying, validating, updating um, critical infrastructure as it's defined generally um, with this, this uh, publicly available data. So that's another coordination kind of activity. Um, I'm going to, since I am working on the state hazard mitigation plan, I'm going to use this work group to help me write uh, a status of what kinds of data sets we might need to better prepare the state um, for hazard uh, response and mitigation. So it's just simply um, like an inventory kind of thing. And it's a, a good place to get on the list of uh, the state actions that need to be taken. So um, there's there might be an action for developing further some specific data sets. Um, five years ago, when I worked on this plan, there was a data action to develop a coastal erosion data set that did not exist. Um, there was a, well, there was one that was very, very old. And so we, um, uh, not we, but 
uh, the, the DNR was able to get a grant to work with um, some entities in Cook and Lake County to develop this coastal erosion data set that now can be used in planning for hazards. And then finally, um, another goal is to work with that hub site and make it live, make it more interactive. All right, um, I went over time a little bit. I think I was supposed to stop at three. So um, that was what I had prepared, but I, as I mentioned before, I, I kind of wanted to give you some context for what we were doing and uh, where this was going, but I'd love to have some discussion and I can also go back and do some more live demo or something if, if there's anything you wanna see more of. Stacy, you've got several nice supporting comments um, in the chat. Well, thank uh, you for that. Um, you know, concerning the level of work that's uh, gone on here and, and, and the vision going forward. So um, maybe why don't we start with Sally? Do you do you want to chip in with something? Sure, Steve. Thanks. Sorry, of course I was snacking in the background, imagine that. <laughs> um, I'll move my camera to the front here. Um, yeah, ton of good work. I mean, I'm just kind of getting caught up with all this being back at Mingeo recently. And I know that the web page has been stood up and that's wonderful, right? So we can kind of keep, keep, keep our eye on the prize, right? Um, and I guess I'd like to report that um, Mengio has started having some conversations. We got a um, we got a little bit of a bump in appropriations to boost our our foundational data work, right? And so one of the first things we've done is we've met with um, Department of Health that does that facilities licensing to try and um, work with them to um, automate. The, that data so it's available online in a geospatial format. Um, what we found is that they have a lot of GIS at health, but it's um, compartmentalized. You might have probably already know that, right? There's also like data care, data, uh, daycare facilities, childcare facilities, and other kind of data that would be helpful that is currently in a tabular format uh, to be. Um, served um, spatially enabled. Um, and so um, I guess that's just one area that I can contribute a little bit of an update as we have started um, that conversation. And really we had a one of their, I think she was like a assistant director or something. And she, they were like, well, we were thinking of geocoding. They're putting together some public facing application. I think they're considering Tableau. And she's like, well, we had plans to do this work in 2024, but you're blowing my mind and I'm really excited about this and let me put my wrap my head around it and things like comments like that. So um, hopefully, you know, those data um, ch can change daily, as you know, right? So there's a lot of change. So to be able to go from a um, uh, tabular database or however they're storing their data to something that's maybe in a service that can be consumed, I think would be um, a real benefit. Um, to the statewide community and at the county level. I've also heard from counties that this is data that they have to geocode every year or every however. And like we were just saying, this data gets stale uh, very quickly. So um, so that's just one little update. I can't make a lot of promises, but that's one place where we're trying to trying to move the ball, so. Thank you, Sally, I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, um, Sally. Ter Teresa, um, you've got a comment in the in the chat. Um, it's, it looks like um, you're getting ready to, to uh, kick off a similar program in your in your county, and uh, this sounds like something that would that would work well for you. Also, is that true? Yeah, I don't have a big role in it, so I don't know much about it. But it sounds like Stacy that you guys have already started collaborating with some some folks. Oh yes. Um... Yeah, it looks like I sent that a message directly to Teresa and didn't share it with everyone. Um, yeah, so she was asking about um, hazard mitigation planning and Olmstead County is one of the counties we're working with this year. So um, 
we will be doing that same sort of thing um, that you saw for Douglas and Isanti. That was a super, super brief uh, <laughs> slide, but um, yeah, that will be done for Olmstead County. So we will be reaching out to Olmstead to make sure that we have the, the data um, that we can have for, um, for that plan. Are you guys just kind of like um, copying and pasting these initiatives and then just kind of swapping out the, you know, the filters and the data and all that? Um, kind of, yeah. So, I mean, obviously each plan for the county is unique in that every county has different risks and vulnerabilities and different actions that they want to take. But the the GIS side of it is, um, is uh kind of like that like we have we have statewide data sets that we're updating and we we filter for the counties and then bring in the the local data but um we verify the data as we go with each county yeah well that's awesome and great to know because i've definitely been brainstorming like you know we we had a a meeting or two with our um emergency management operations team and we're talking about all this stuff. And so, you know, looking at different solutions and things mm -hmm. like that. And so it's great to, to see this. And, and I think we just set up yesterday, a partnered collab with ArcGIS Online with U Spatial and University of Minnesota. So I saw that and I yeah. wasn't sure <laughs> what that was for. Um, I mean, I wasn't really involved, but are you in emergency management or are you? In um, I'm just sort of being brought in for the GIS perspective within the county. Oh, okay. Well, maybe and we so, can talk offline. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it is really a challenge. I think anyone on this call can acknowledge that. Just um, this emergency management professionals, you know, they don't have time to be GIS professionals as right, well. Right, exactly. And so it's it's uh, always a uh, an opportunity to try to share how. GIS data can be used. And then once it's used um, and they see the value in that, um, how important it is to keep it up to date and keep it mm -hmm. ready to go so that it is actually available. It doesn't just happen, like it has to be um, developed. <laughs> so, right, so yeah. Um, yeah, and so that we are hoping that we are helping counties with that. And yeah, um, I have lots of information I can give you. So we'll talk. Great. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And definitely happy to share the the load and the burden. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? I think Sam earlier had did. I don't know if she's still with us. Sam, yep, are I'm you still here? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I was just saying that, yeah, this is really incredible work because, I mean, yeah, here at Geocom, we're mostly focused on points and roads uh, for address, site structure address points and road center lines. But um, just even thinking just broadly for the community um, and the uses that this data can have, this is going to be life-saving and life-changing. So I'm delighted and excited to see that this is going on here in the state of Minnesota. So, yeah. Great. Um, Sam, remind me who you are with. The I'm with Geocom. Geocom. Okay. Yep. Well, thanks everybody for the encouragement. I am um, excited about this work. It's been really fun, and it would be great. Um, Sam, if you're interested in joining our work group, that would be welcome for sure. Yeah, certainly. I'd be happy to. I can, I can send you a separate invite and anyone else too, of course. Um, yeah, Rachel from DOT, I haven't met you. Hi, Stacey. I Hi. actually just drafted an email to you and I was trying to be polite <laughs> and not hit send yet. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, DOT. Yeah. I, I uh, yeah, connected a little bit with Bobby, but um, I, I don't know that he's been able to attend. So it would be great to have somebody from DOT involved with this work as well. So, 
Yeah, it would be great. Um, and just a real quick um, a synopsis of my email, I guess, for everyone else. I was really just listening and as a guest here, so I'm the state hydraulic resiliency engineer mm -hmm. for MnDOT. And this is a pretty new position. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do and, and leaning heavily on GIS professionals for is trying to compile our records of past flood events. Um, we have a lot of different records and very few of them are spatially referenced. <laughs> um, but we really want to have um, the data in one place and be able to view it on a map so that we can overlay it with other things like um, pavement condition or um, pipe or bridge condition. And being able to overlay all those different layers would help us prioritize projects. Um, and so there's kind of two parts to my email. First is three parts. First is I agree. This is awesome. I'm really happy to see the work that you're doing. Um, and I think that we could um, benefit from just learning about different things that you've been, you and your team have been considering as you create these um, like user interfaces. Um, so um, first of all, looking for any additional information about past flood events that anyone in this group has. Um, you know, like I said, we have a handful or more of different sources just internally, but I know there's more out there. Um, so just kind of open invitation that if anyone knows of um, GIS data sets that indicate past flood location and or extent, um, I'd love to know about those. Um, and then secondly, um, I don't know that I'm qualified to be in the work group, but I would definitely like to just be in the loop and aware of the, the progress that's being made. So, yeah. Thanks, Rachel. I don't, I don't know that um, you can't not be qualified to be on the work group. I, work. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really been interesting to just hear why people need critical why people need these data, you know? So it doesn't matter if you are actually, a, you know, the geospatial wrangler or just an end or not just, but it, or you're using it for something, it's helpful yeah. to kind of have these different perspectives um, on, on what's needed and how it can be pulled together, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, I will, I'm gonna coordinate with Erin Meyer. She's the one that made me aware of this meeting, which I really appreciate. Um, so I'm not sure if it makes more sense for it to be me or Erin, but um, one way or the other, it's awesome work. We'd love to be kept in the loop. So thanks. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to add on to that. I mean, my only use of this data would be if we have a project in the state of Minnesota for any particular county. And if that data was somehow like related to our address points layer, then I would be using maybe the the ref this layer as a reference point or something. So it's not even just so much that, you know, uh, you have to like have certain credentials or have all this knowledge or know how. It's just you are already here. Let's work together and see what we can come up with together. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Well, Stacy, it certainly sounds like you've gotten validation on your work. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 my biggest takeaway was geospatial intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think, can I use it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, good. Um, is yeah. there anything anything else for Stacy? This has been a, a wonderful um, follow on discussion. I I think it's been helpful in identifying the value and the the opportunities for to connect with others. So that's great. Thanks. All right, going once, going twice. And go get in the jacuzzi, I think, is the answer. So thanks, everybody. I'll put the recording up online, uh, EPC YouTube. If there's something you want to reference back to, uh, by all means, it'll be there. Okay. And Thank I you, can Steve. share those links, too, in the slides. Um, yeah, because they wouldn't come through on the recording. So you can share those out. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you.